since we have overshot time by 25 minutes, I'll uh, request all speakers to limit to or adhere to the time and if they can save two or three minutes, it will give extra time for question answer session. Thank you. Please start. Thank you. And uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to Dr. Jawahar, who's been my friend from my Shri Chitra days. And uh, so thank you uh, for the Academy of Hospital Administration and the whole SASH team for not only inviting me here, but for the excellent hospitality. So I'm going to speak to you a little about the changing ecosystem that we are facing. And more as the senior members present here as to what is our responsibility towards the juniors who are yet in training to prepare them because right now we are riding this cusp. And the responsibility is really on us to make sure that we don't falter and we create a good ecosystem for the future generations to come. So just as we start, I want to just, this is an um, introduction to the fragment ecosystem that we are working in at the moment. So it is impossible to really work with such fragmented ecosystems to come to a decision of any conclusion or any sensible conclusion, not only in population health, which is almost impossible, but also for the individual's care because the diseases are becoming more complex, we are living longer, and therefore we need a system which can really integrate everything together. So I'm talking about this new normal, which actually starts with Ayushman Bharat's digital health mission, which to my mind is the most ambitious objective or the policy that any government could have ever dreamt of. And to that, I think it's really, you know, it's very congratulatory to the Indian government to have, a, you know, come up with a scheme like this, which talks about empowering the citizen by giving the control of data in their hands eventually, creating a personal health record. That's going to be a long journey, but we are all part of that, and we need to make that journey successful. And this is realizing the importance of data management. So the entire M effort is about, and the whole emphasis is on good management of data, the healthcare data of the, of the public. And of course, the little brush that we had with COVID, which awakened all of us to the possibilities or the immense possibilities of what's the digital technology and the tools that, a lot of them were already available to us, but not being used. But when we started using, we. Uh, we started realizing the immense potential of digital technology. And then, because of COVID emerged, this entire new set of profile of the healthcare seekers, who have suddenly realized that they can get everything that they want in the palm of their hand. You know, virtually everything can be available on your phone, and that's the desire. Just like how we access our banking, our telecom, and our tra travel services on phone, everybody wants to access healthcare on phone now. So it was only natural that healthcare providers need to really now walk this journey. And Ayushman Bharat's digital health mission eventually aspires to really connect the entire ecosystem to make that possible for every citizen of India. And how will it do this? The preventive health, the prescriptive health, and the entire population health is being connected on a backbone of a digital platform. That's eventually what it is. And connecting all the dots of the patient care journey or in fact, I should say not the patient care journey, but the citizen's health journey, because a lot of non-illness related, but health related episodes are also connected. And that's how the entire ecosystem is developing. So what are we talking about? See, conventionally, what do you do in medicine? We look at the patient, we take a set of data, we analyze that in our own mind based on the knowledge that we have from the books and literature and all of that. And we come up with the diagnosis. Now this is dependent on the physician's skill and the intelligence and his memory and all of that stuff and his learning. What are we trying to do now? 
The process does not change at all. But the tools to arrive at that prescription, we are now augmenting the physician's ability to arrive at the decision more accurately and with a higher speed. And that is the transformation that we are trying to do through digital technologies. The whole process remains unchanged. We, don't, we are not doing anything different, but we are doing it in a, with a different methodology. The tools of the trade are now changing. And look at the technologies that have been available to us in the last decade. A whole, I mean, all of us are using all this. And the technologies of the current decade. And I'm not even, you know, I, I don't even want to venture into what will happen into the decade after that. Because we're going to be diff living in a totally different world. But there are certain deterrents of making this dream, you know, or realizing this dream. You know, we have this opportunity now, but we have to really get over our fear. A lot of fear that the physicians have traditionally had is about not understanding what this digital technology is going to do to our job or the way we work or, or what is, there's a little bit of a fear. So I think part of that fear went away during COVID, but, and part of that um, physician, uh, the, the patient's fear about dehumanization of care and lack of that touch and feel also went away. But just to tell you, even technology is developing to give you that entire haptic perception that you have on palpation. And you know, the, the digital stethoscope give you better features and better diagnosis and ability to diagnose than a conventional stethoscope uh, uh, examination does. So digital technology is also improving the entire touch and feel aspect. Therefore, you're, you will have a better technology to help you do what you conventionally have been doing. But the biggest challenge is the digital illiteracy of the stakeholders. You know, this. If we do not um, educate ourselves at this time, and the reason is because we, we have decided that we have a policy of digital health, you know, uh, creating a digital health ecosystem, uh, really moving towards that. But the people who are already working in the healthcare sector, they are not literate, they are not data literate. They do not know what is happening. They do not know what they have to do and why they have to do. And because there is this gap, it is not possible to envisage, you know, how this uh, entire buildup of ABDM will be. And in that, the, the newer generation, the youngsters who are sitting here or who are in training, we have to make sure that we do, we do train them while they're in college. And we need to really look at new opportunities that this ecosystem is providing us. One is, of course, our entire approach to data collection and usage has to change. So far, we've been using, you know, all of us, we know that we are very secretive about keeping our data. We don't want to share patients' files. We don't want to share it with the other hospitals. We don't want to share it. Uh, we limited share with, with the government and, of course, very limited share also with some patients. That attitude has to change. We need to, the technology providers need to change their attitude. Today what happens, the software developers come to us, they have de developed a technology with a certain processes and they adopt it. They do not discuss with the healthcare working for, workforce. We are the stakeholders. They need to discuss with us what processes we need. Instead, what is happening, they make processes and tell us to change the way we do things. And that is because we don't engage enough with them. We shy away from ta talking to the technology people. The technology providers need to be led by us. We should not be following the technology developers. And that's very important. If the healthcare system has to work for us, then we need to make sure that we lead it. This also will create opportunities for more transparent and more accurate uh, billing systems uh, more faster claim processings, and therefore a build up, build in the trust by the patient. The transparency that the system gives and the data that, we, that the patient will have on their fingertips will also improve the relationship that uh, is between the doctor and the patient, which is really at a very low level at this moment. 
as I mentioned, this is also of, this is also going to result in cost reduction. Look at the duplication of cost that happens to us today. I mean, let's say a, a person from a rural, you know, Bihar, Jharkhand, gets some ailment and, you know, three, four months, they go to multiple physicians, multiple investigations, duplicate investigations, come to a city like Delhi, there again they run around, and every investigation gets repeated. And by the time they come to a diagnosis, they have no money left. Whereas if you're connected through an ecosystem, a digital system across the country, all those investigations, reviews could be done by specialists sitting in bigger towns, bigger hospitals, and only if a care that really requires the presence of the patient in a big, different city or a different hospital, the patient needs to travel. So look at the saving on the cost that will happen. And of course, rational decision making. And as we move towards more customized clinical care, you will, also waste, you will also reduce the waste on the clinical care. Because as we customize that whole standard approach, there is a lot of waste which is not required for a particular patient. So we will give only what is required and therefore save costs to the patient. As I mentioned about tech for health, and every uh, software technology developer must make sure that they are capable of in creating interoperable systems that can capture accurate data, seamless transfer of data across systems, the secure systems, and also they should be auditable. They should be auditable just as we are audited. And technology providers have to not be a vendor, they have to be a partner, they have to come on the side of the care provider because once you're riding that system and your data is sitting on, the t on this a uh, system that is provided by the solution providers, then they are part of the data, you know, storage. And therefore, a, they should be subject to the same audits that a healthcare provider is subjected to. And therefore, the responsibility for data security should be shared. And of course, there are a lot of financial models, which as we develop uh, building the relationship between the software vendor and the hospitals, the relationship is also about financial sharing and the ease of doing business together. So the institutions like the Academy of Hospital Administration and various other teaching, you know, skill building organizations like NHRC and all that, they have to focus on how to bridge this gap. It's a huge task. Look, the amount of healthcare workforce that is existing in the country today is huge. And we have to simultaneously bring them up to speed. So the, the, the you know, whether we, how do we motivate them? How do we make sure that they're incentivized appropriately and all the healthcare providers really look at it positively? Yeah, that's, that's our job. And we also need to uh, educate the public. You know, it's no point telling the patient that the, you can, you have the right to access your data or you have the right to provide access to the people that you need. The person doesn't know, the patient doesn't know. I mean, we all know, we've seen patients who will come and when you start telling them uh, their prognosis and, you know, disease-related findings, they'll say, Dr. Sahib, aap kuch bhi karlo. So, we have to educate that community because it is no point creating a system which has a personal health record in the hands of the patient and patient knows, patient does not know what to do about it because the, the dangers of such a scenario are far greater than what we have today with the, the kind of illiteracy uh, about data. So, and we need to tell the patient, we need to educate the patient about participative decision making, about their role, because this is also, uh, you know, a journey to improve the kind of uh, trust quotient that we need to build with them. And we need to, you know, therefore, uh, educate the public, that's very important. So the entire landscape has to change. We have to shed what we have been thinking with the last 30, 40 years or even before that. I mean, 30, 40 years is my, you know, my career time. But we need to start, we are now starting to look at wellness, much more than the disease. We need to start looking at the population's outcome-based approach rather than service-based approach, paying based on the outcomes. And 
focus on providing continuity of care, seamless uh, sharing of data, seamless transfer of data, and really move towards uh, predictive and proactive customized healthcare. The, yeah. And uh, eventually, the entire, uh, you know, I think the intangible benefit that I can see is that this will restore the transparency, ethics, and the trust that we are losing. And uh, the path to safe and sustainable healthcare will be through this connected care. And all I want to say is that the only thing that changes from what we are doing conventionally now and in the digital health ecosystem is changing the tools of documentation. It's all about appropriate, correct documentation by using digital technology. And that's all. So there is nothing to be afraid of. We just need to embrace the technology, learn it, and it's like using a smartphone. So the roles of the government will be to facilitate, hospital to implement, and patients' demand will continuously increase because, the, in fact, the demand will be much faster that, uh, rather than the supply if we don't educate ourselves fast enough. And we need to really embrace the new technologies with a very open mind. And this, my dear friends, is the moment for us. So if we really do not lead the technology from the front, we will lose this battle. So we should make sure that it is led by the healthcare provider because it's about healthcare. And for all of us who are in positions that we have to prepare the ecosystem for the future, we should do our bit. And for the youngsters, you should be ready to really take the challenge of the future because that's going to look very different from what it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uma. You spoke about uh, how to go towards new normal from existing fragmented care. You also spoke about uh, cost reduction and also about reducing the harm to patient. As director of few cancer hospitals, I have seen indiscriminately CT being prescribed. One CT gives radiation equivalent to 40 to 200 X-rays. Thus, if you do three CTs, you are giving equal doses of MRI that is almost 40 sievert, which can cause cancer. And if we really can put that data of a CT on patient record, definitely other two CTs can be avoided. It is really being done, I have seen it myself, and I have uh, rebuked so many times my physicians about it. Uh, one technology we have seen uh, in three years about conducting delivery using technology. And uh, these days patients also come. They have sieved through Google everything. And when they come, they are over empowered perhaps. But yes, to our mass, we require patient empowerment who can help in taking decisions about their disease. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sanjeev Singh. He'll speak about health technology assessment strategic decision-making tool. Please start, Dr. Sanjeev. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, sir, and uh, huge respect for being a, so, such a great mentor. Thank you, Dr. Johar, for inviting and organizing such a fantastic program. Uh, I have had a long association. I have been a Manlu all my life uh, and uh, as an association with Dr. Johar uh, for 18 years when, when I was in Kerala and recently shifted. Thank you, Academy of Hospital Administration, for organizing this. <coughs> So I'll be speaking on health technology assessment. I, uh, it's a misnomer. It's a, it's a tool which is uh, given by National Institute of Clinical Excellence UK. It's a strategic tool, doesn't fit into completely into technology forum, but uh, even technology could be decided uh, based on this. Uh, So 
so uh, if if i have or a government have or any institution has 100 crore of rupee the question is should i invest in pap smear uh, ca cervix or should i invest in identification of human papilloma virus estimation so this particular tool could be applied for government decision making it could be applied for public health it could be applied for technology it could be applied for processes <coughs> so if i have 100 crores as a government or as an institute should i invest in buying more fancy machines uh, intuitive academies robotic xi plus or should i still go ahead with an open and laparoscopic surgery and uh, let's see if hta can help us take that decision should i invest in employing clinical pharmacist or should i go ahead with just identifying that there are medication errors and it is not reported as uh, we expect it is uh, the national database of all accredited hospitals 1500 hospitals in the country is 0.04 vis-a-vis 3.2 from uh, international society of medical practice so what do i do so we know that the healthcare expenditure is uh, cost is a driver healthcare expenditure is a driver and every uh, 2.3 million people they do come below the pov poverty line because of our uh, efforts and we have done a bit of survey to understand uh, what would be the technology contribution in the bill 42% of the bill in the hospital more more so in a corporate hospital uh, comes from the technology introduction and uh, now we are getting technology freak and uh, we would either like to do more procedures because we are following a us based model of sub specialty practice <clears throat> but this is what we need to do where uh, this was a nice article amir kasim uh, published it in annals of internal medicine where he says high value cost conscious care and how does we go for a high value cost conscious care and hta is a good model so national institute of clinical excellence adopted it 1960s they have been doing it and they help uh, nhs take this decision the uh, uk center for medicare and medicaid ota helps to take this decision uh, in 2010 we did a first uh, uh, fellowship program on hta at amrita institute along with who and it was so glad to see that uh, dhr took this up and they have formulated a body but it is uh, almost a defunct body there are three people working unfortunately no major activity which has been done what exactly is hta so if you ask for any tool any technology any process any device any drug you have to first look at evidence and evidence could only be looked at by doing a systematic review then these are the three uh, three words which we generally uh, use as avial we mix it and we don't present it we always keep saying about cost effectiveness but it is cost benefit effective and utility service and then any decision which you take should be ethical legal patient safety and societal benefit so let's see how how does that work so generally what happens i was doing an assessment of a of a very very good reputed uh, government medical college college in the country and i went uh, with the professor of orthopedics in his ward and uh, there was a patient of uh, femur fracture we saw and i asked them what did you do he said he did intramedullary nailing so i said is that the best service so he said uh, yeah he has been doing it for donkey's years that's the best uh, uh, service which i can offer i looked at the drug drug chart the first drug which he had given was injection meropenem so i asked him why he says he has been giving it for 10 15 years second drug was injection piperacillin tazobactam and i asked him why he says he is not sure about the infection control practices in operation theater so he wants to give two so he is giving two gram negative drug with a almost similar mechanism of action third drug was injection tramadol i asked him why he says he has done a big surgery and the patient has pain i asked the patient do you have pain patient said no fourth drug was on injection ondansetron and i asked him why he said don't you know when you give tramadol you have to give ondansetron so i asked the patient do you have nausea patient said no fifth was three pints of dns uh, normal saline so uh, almost a decade back it has been declared that it is an abnormal composition uh, still called as normal saline i asked him why he said that every patient gets admitted gets a peripheral infusion fifth sixth drug was injection mvi and i asked him why he says the patients wants to see a yellow colored multivitamin injection get into the body so that they feel powerful so where are we is the lowest 
it's an experience based opinion based or eminence based practice which we think is an evidence based practice and that is where each clinician in each hospital administrator needs to change the clinician the card there is a hierarchy which exists in the hospital there are cardiovascular thoracic surgeon there is cardiologist there is god then there are other physicians and surgeons this group keeps they, there is a decibel based management and they ask for more in tools until unless we also know as an administrator to do, do systematic reviews to do review of literature we will not improve how do we do <clears throat> post operative pain is it important most of the surgeons believe that post surgery patient will have pain and this is gone this they should have zero pain and that is how the evidence says and it is from uh, level 1 to uh, level 3 <coughs> CPOE again is computerized patient order entry and we have seen this in our hospital when we went digital that only saving of printing paper is close to 4 crore per annum and plus uh, enormous uh, impact because everything is whatever you have documented is all available. So that's the science and that is how we should take a decision. 2019, my wife was suffering from spondylolisthesis uh, in disc prolapse and S1 fracture and we went for uh, PLIF surgery and uh, by the time we would, we have shifted to uh, Delhi. She was admitted in the hospital, she was taken to the theatre, uh, she was, uh, uh, she was asked, she was getting a subclavial line done and her BP dropped and for three hours she was at 60-40 on operation theatre table and nobody had a clue why. And soon they realized that it was a blind subclavian line and they perforated a pulmonary artery and she landed into uh, cardiac tamponade and hemoperfusion. Why? Because the basic sonographic guided, which is, a, which is a practice nowadays and that's how technology should be used and it is cost benefit and effective which was not done. And this is where we need to use this tool which is called as health technology assessment for strategic decision making. So, if we have to take a decision between cyber knife and linear accelerator, what should we do? We had cobalt therapy, we had a linear accelerator, we had cyber knife, it moves with the respiration and it is robotic in nature, so what do we take? So, you do a systematic review, you look at all the articles which are there, it looks very, uh, uh, the most advanced cyber knife. 30 crores, 20 crores of your investment, but you see the local control is only 70 percent, whereas the cost per treatment is 36,000. If you look at linear accelerator, 10 crore, 20 crore of maintenance, the local control is 90. The cyber Nikes looks robotic, look hip, and we would like to buy it because Hospital X also has it. Local control is less and the cost is higher, and that is where we need to change the decision making pattern. Hand hygiene, everybody knows it's, it's important. We don't have any data, <coughs> US based India. The cost of training is just 700 rupees per training. And uh, the surgical site infection is close to 52,000 uh, every time when you do. These are the line items which we should measure. Every work which an administrator do should have science, should have business attached to it. And then post uh, intervention and after intervention surgical site infection the number of surgical site infection avoided is 40 and just by hand hygiene and basic training you are saving 21 lakh of rupees in one unit and in one year imagine if you have 54 units in the hospital what is going to be the impact similarly for ventilator associated pneumonia so these are the cost saving where it is close to for all uh, device associated infections plus <coughs> the impact so it's close to 2 crore in just one department and your investment is $1 and your return of investment is $236. So this is where we look at evidence which is level 1, we look at cost benefit, you look at morbidity mortality is cost effective and look at theatre utilisation and ICU utilisation which is cost uh, utility. There is also cost of bad will and litigation which also will get saved. So similarly, if we have to understand a process, if we want to introduce any new process, should, can we use HTA as a tool? The answer is yes. VTE profile access, again, uh, <clears throat> almost 28 years back, I took my mother who had CS cervix stage 1 to the most prestigious hospital in the country and uh, surgery was done. The basic thing of uh, avoiding pulmonary embolism was not given to her and uh, she died and I lost her. 
Why I lost her is because just basic risk assessment and VT prophylaxis was not given because we think surgery is the ultimate and we don't follow. So right process was not followed and I lost my mother. We need to do systematic review, look at the signs and see <clears throat> what would be the best, best evidence. So there is a Caprini score for risk assessment and management for surgical patient. And based on that, you work. There is a PODA score for medical uh, patients who need to have DVT. And based on that, you do a cost benefit. <clears throat> for every act which is done in the hospital, you need to work. So there is a 45,000 uh, cost for treating pulmonary embolism because if, if DVT happens and if there is, a, uh, there is a pulmonary embolism, that's the cost. There is also an indirect cost, so the total cost is close to 51,000 rupees versus a low molecular weight heparin being given once, 1,914 rupees. You are saving with each DVT prophylaxis assessment, you are saving 49,000 rupees. Highest level of evidence, there is a cost benefit, there is a cost effectiveness and there is a utility and that is how all processes need to be defined in the hospital. <clears throat> if you look at quali and uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, it is uh, the quali, the utility value is 0.63, uh, the value which is gained uh, if you do this practice is 3.84, the total PE gain is close to 2, <clears throat> so amount spent if I am able to get at least one quali for a patient who would have undergone a surgery or would have been a chronic uh, medical patient requiring a DVT prophylaxis, the saving is close to 44,000 per patient. So should I invest in this process, should I not? This is how HTA helps you to decide. The final example is getting a manpower. We generally as an administrator, we think that additional manpower is a burden and we should not, we should avoid it. So should I invest in appointing clinical pharmacists to avoid medical medication error. What is the evidence? Evidence says that it is 1A, highest level of evidence. This is a fantastic group of people who have done six years of course called PharmD and uh, they, they do fantastic job. So there is, uh, what is the impact? Just on one group of patient which is carcinoma stomach, the length of stays because of them reduces, the direct cost reduces, the indirect cost reduces and the impact is close to the cost benefit ratio is 5.818. Right now we don't even report medication error because we don't know what is medication error. We don't know the definition. There are nine types of medication error and we always confuse it with adverse drug reaction and adverse drug event. So one medication error is close to 22,000 rupees. You need to cost everything what you do in the hospital. So if I appoint a clinical pharmacist at 40,000 rupees and she can take care of two medication error in a month, I am taking care of <coughs> patient safety issue and I'm not doing a podium talk and I'm living, I'm walking the talk uh, with it. Along with this, you need to also do ethical care. <coughs> patient autonomy is one because every time you do an HTA, uh, it needs to be <coughs> ethical in decision. There is a beneficence, so doing good to others is important uh, way of strategic decision making. non beneficence because you need to always work on harm versus uh, benefit and justice. If you are not able to, when you are rounding and a routine round in ICU and you don't shift the patient, it is injustice, it is non-ethical, it is unethical because you are not allowing a critical care patients to get in and that's how the hospital administration works. So, and then there are legal point of view. So I'll summarize, the practices should support clinical evidence and we should do systematic review. The clinicians should not barge in or with high decibels say that they, wa they want linear accelerator, they want cyber knife, they want tomotherapy, they want 3D LINAC, they want MR LINAC and they want proton beam therapy. They will always say that we should do our exercise of doing systematic reviews and we should be trained to understand the science. There has to be a cost factor. Every decision which you take in the hospital, there is a cost to it. There is a business case and, and that is where we need to get trained. <clears throat> there are patient safety exercises which we need to do and a comprehensive evaluation and not leading our decision because hospital X has done it and hospital Y based on competition. We should not be taking these strategic decisions. So in, in the end, HTA 
is the answer and uh, I am I'm sure it would be of benefit and in the end I would like to invite all of you to this new hospital which is just one month old at Faridabad and uh, we would like to seek your blessings and guidance. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Sanjeev Singh. I had been knowing him for the last 15 years at least and if you ask me what is clinical governance and what is hospital administration actually means in a hospital, it will not be exaggeration to say, please go and see how Dr. Sanjeev Singh functions. I think he has amplified everything in his talk about opportunity cost, cost benefit analysis, or importance of introduction of new technology, and also about medication error. Yes, medication error, we all administrators must think of. If you, I give you one example, that in US alone, because of medication error, the deaths are equivalent to one Boeing crashing every day. Just imagine one Boeing aircraft crash every day, it makes news. But because of medication errors, one Boeing air crash equivalent patients are dying every day doesn't make any news. But we do have to think about it as administrators. So, uh, meanwhile, I will ask the organizer to connect the Ganesh Pillai. Till they connect, I will speak more about the this one this thing about the introduction, introduction of technology. Of technology. Uh, uh, I think, I think uh, the, the previous speaker spoke about, about the uh, training 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 training. Training. Yeah. 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 In healthcare. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Thanks, thanks, to Professor and Jawar Pillai. Thanks to the organizers of SAS 2022. In fact. Uh, uh, I will go a little more into the technology enabler for attaining the digitization process in hospitals for better health care. Uh, the key enabling technology is Internet of Things. We would specifically say it Internet of Medical Things, IOMT. But the general scope is that it involves everything in hospital, inside, outside. Uh, I'll start with the challenges. There is a high demand, of course, all of us know. Professionals are running short in the field, workload being more. And of course, COVID has created a distraction for the medical profession to some people. We will also have a work, uh, uh, health worker shortage by 2030, as predicted by uh, who? Then, uh, uh, in fact, it's a challenging time for the hospital administrators to manage under such difficult scenario. And uh, also, to uh, just uh, we are discussing regarding the, the errors, medical errors, to reduce that, we need assistance, we need more data. The data, connected data we need, in that light, Internet of Things should be really uh, beneficial, our aging population is growing, then uh, uh, consumerism is there, we need to have things connected, things recorded. In that light, I would like to introduce what is Internet of Things. In fact, many things are there, whatever is there, whatever we see across, whatever living entity or non-living entity, all are things which can be sensed and connected to the internet through some medium and in fact in the internet 
we have uh, storage computing space today earlier things were needing computers to compute computers to store pen drives cd roms data drives everything to store but today with internet we can store it seamlessly anywhere that we call as cloud we can access we can compute things there we can run our intelligent algorithms to assist in decision making so then we can access those information wherever we want through our mobiles through our desktops laptops whatever we like so physical object along with the controllers sensors and actuators plus in internet is giving us internet of things so the connectivity is uh, in fact anything anywhere application domains are many in fact right from smart healthcare to industry 4.0 it will be uh, not exaggerated if i say that healthcare has come up as an industry today globally so industry 4.0 and certifications are also application to that uh, applicable to that then we have energy sector smart city other sectors where we uh, really everywhere almost and today we talk about this healthcare so in fact iot along with machine intelligence has created uh, a lot uh, uh, it's a it's a dramatic uh, dramatic change has happened across the global scenario iot is the uh, uh, is the technology that gathers data and gathering data has become so huge that in fact it's very difficult for human being to look at that data and take some information so that uh, iot gather data today we call it as a big data so that gets analyzed with machine intelligence tools and with that the output is that healthcare becomes more reliable errors gets reduced hospital management becomes easy with elevated transparency hospitals become smart so these are different sectors we can have a better patient flow management we can have tracking of hospital assets patient management indoor outdoor icu anywhere tracking of uh, 24 by icu monitoring integrated hospital information management then energy management in hospital that's very important smart parking see if a delay is there in the parking place then we lose that time from the life of the person then of course the security control and surveillance today's in the consumerism world hospital being open to people across then we need more security more control more monitoring that's where iot comes smartly to help us we'll now start with this is a, uh, this is this is a case how a person checks into an hospital then uh, gets thing in the parking and all these things are assisted then locate and book uh, finding different services from hospital rooms close uh, where you want to visit go then uh, report issues if it is there then uh, anything so notifications everything come and hospital check out this optimal flow reduces the workload of the people reduces the tension of the patient also uh, smoothens everything asset is very important in the sense people think that uh, see if any asset is misplaced it is not found at the proper time it is as good as not being there or it's lost just think of an oxygen cylinder of course nowadays hospitals are having continuous uh, supply of oxygen through uh, cables but if any instrument which is important anything that is important that's not found in time or cannot be located so you can understand what is the havoc that is going to cause uh, here you can see any hospital asset can be tracked be it a wheelchair be it a, uh, be it some uh, stretcher be it any any medicine so all, all the assets, assets are, are supposed, supposed to be converted, to be converted as, as part part assets with enabling technologies, technologies put in there, there and they will be connected, connected very nicely, nicely through, through gateways, gateways to, the to the internet, internet, internet and, and we can access, access through that, that Whatever whatever they want, want their mobiles, their mobiles, their desktops, their, 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 their,
so, so that's, that's becoming important, important. and then and this is patient, patient management, management the outer patient, patient management, management with, with digital, digital technology it becomes more smart, more smart more infinitely more, more smooth people uh, uh, feel the hassle feel streamline services uh, with uh, optimal, optimal use of resources, resources right right from the from time, time when, when i am, I am intending, intending to go to an hospital to avail some service, service and, and till, till i come, I come out, out of the hospital i can, I can avail, avail the, the internet, internet of things getting connected to my mobile app and everything i can use, I can use it, it for my, for my uh, uh, smooth smooth movement, movement. and then and then of course indoor patients for indoor patients patient requirements, requirements their personal, their personal uh, information, information their, 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 their health, health information, information accessing the health care person or finding, uh, finding proper, proper services, services both from, both from the hospital side, side from the patient side, side both can both be, can be uh, made, made easy. easy so, so uh, uh, that will that be as you see your quality of care, care and, and also address, address the uh, uh, shortage of human resources in the hospital then then of course we can have the remote patient management and uh, through, through uh, internet, uh, internet of things, of things uh, we can, uh, we can uh, monitor, monitor things, things we can control things, things we can give decisions which is which is required, required sometimes time distance that will that will in fact reduce the, the load of the hospital, hospital infrastructure, infrastructure of course and, and also, also gives, uh, gives uh, 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 timely service, service to the patients, to the patients. so so it's very ridiculous to say Okay. 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 Fine. Fine. So, so uh, emergency cases, cases seen, seen ICU moving issues, issues, so people, so people, can, people can, can be monitored through healthcare person directly. directly. The devices, the devices, the sensors, the sensors being, being connected to the, the patient, patient they, they can be very, very nicely, nicely monitored, monitored and decisions can be taken. There it there itself on the way, the patient, the patient can, be can be given on arrival the required treatment. So, so to save, to save the, the things in any emergency. So that's one of the things. And in fact, the data being collected here is only through IoT in the ambulance. So, so of course, of course uh, uh, person, person can, can get a better delivery. delivery. This, this IoT was, was not that uh, known, known to be before, before the availability, availability of wireless services. services. And today, and today we have we have similar, similar to uh, uh, wireless services, services that, that has made it more more um, lucrative, lucrative, more affordable, 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 and more, and more uh, relevant, relevant to this context. context. So, so issue monitoring, monitoring similarly can be done for this. In fact, in fact uh, uh, most of the most times, times you see patients they demand that, that I should be monitored for my seven. seven. But it's, but it's next to possible. possible. It's, it's, it's impossible for any healthcare professional to monitor, monitor somebody for my seven, seven without, without any error. error. So in so such situations, the the, the sensors, sensors giving, giving out data that can be automatically to machine intelligent algorithms they can be analyzed and the triggers. Can be said, the alerts can be raised, can be raised when, when such situations demand demanded, and it's and highly, highly reliable. reliable. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, so, so it's possible. possible. Where we have more mostly required for elderly, elderly people and, and uh, people, people who demand, demand clinically. clinically. So, so such things, things again. again. So, so different, different body parts, parts can be, can be uh, sent, sent through IoT to the cloud, cloud and, can and, and can be accessed to the people. people. Uh, uh, here, here I, I would like to stress, stress upon one thing, just, just uh, came to, came my, to mind, my mind when I was talking, talking regarding, uh, uh, regarding, regarding multiple, multiple uh, investigations, investigations happening in the same patient when they were one, one hospital, hospital to other hospital. Other hospital. Uh, certain, certain, certain investigations like, like the, the where, where it is there, let's see, 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 those centers, Those centers can, can be, be centrally, centrally connected, connected across, across and, and with, with some controlling, some controlling uh, managing, uh, managing people, people around, around so that, so that the, the data generated at one center can be can available on demand to other centers, centers by, by prohibiting multiple multiple, multiple uh, investigations, investigations in the same person. person. So, so that's, that's possible, possible by connecting, connecting different, different centers, centers of investigation and different parts places in, in uh, to all other, all other certified, certified places, places wherever, wherever is required. Is required. 
in fact in fact this smart house we already want to reduce our energy consumption for for selling our expenditure so that the expenditure does not load on to the patient ultimately so that can be done with part in management and this and is this completely an iot technology it's done it's done everywhere, everywhere we can do so you can see that, can see that. So, so the analysis, the analysis of energy, of energy consumption, consumption then the integration of malaise mode and control, control can, be can be taken, taken. Smart parking, smart parking is effectively, effectively at many, many multiple, uh, multi uh, multi parking places, many other places. places. The smartness, the smartness can, be can, be can be interpreted, which can, which can uh, uh, people can have their smartphones, save time, save their resources. Digital parking. Digital parking. Finally, Finally there is the circular circular you know, many of our people complain that, that uh, the doctor, the doctor is, examining is examining the patient, but others are uh, uh, peeping in, going, going inside. inside. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere somebody is not authorized to access, access. they are getting, getting access. access. The, the, so, so, that, that control, control can be done, can be done while this IoT technology is biometric through introduction of RFID tags. So, that will reduce the trespassing with smart facility management. Proactive maintenance and monitoring. So this so can this be done in the smart hospital environment. And of course, we integrate, integrate the hospital information, information management, management technology. This is really a challenge, challenge because, because we are generating uh, information uh, through uh, multiple vendors, multiple, multiple, multiple sources. sources. So that so can that be done. done. And the barrier in the smart hospital is that uh, diversification of technology, then, then people, people uh, uh, think that there is a data, data theft data and security, security which is presently addressed very nicely. nicely. Then standardization, standardization issue also. also. Then, then we need, we need to, to have a reliable application to say we want to use 4G, 4G and 5G. And 5G and and by 2030, 2030 we envision that, that 6G will be coming in the force where seamless access of communication, reliability, Can happen, can happen and across, and across the, globe, the globe where we have used most of our satellite, satellite communication, communication systems. systems. So, so uh, that's why that's we have for a smart hospital for better healthcare. In fact, inter internet of things is going, going to be going everywhere by 2030 as per the estimate with 6th generation in class. So, so uh, it may it seem difficult, difficult to move forward, forward with next stages towards the smart, smart hospital, 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 but it will really, really help, help uh, 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 everybody, everybody in the hospital, 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 hospital in giving better, better services, services and also, and also there will be tangible advantages, 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 just like Graham like was saying, there is fear, fear, fear factor is there, people who are not having knowledge about technology, so people around there to breach the fear factor, to increase the reliability, to Uh, to, uh, to provide, provide better quality, quality in all aspects, aspects. sensing, sensing communication, communication with the aspects, 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 and, and make, make, make the graphical graph user interface, user interface more, 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 more friendly, friendly, more and more, and more, more uh, 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 talking, talking to the human beings also, people also who, are who are less, less uh, knowledge uh, digital, digital technologies. These are my few references. There is something in the name of 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 the one hour of fear, that you can start treatment before patient leaves home, so that you save that much of time. We also talk about patient monitoring, about triggers and alerts. Definitely it saves a lot of time. And the late end period by the time doctor realizes and institutes something. Energy management we know it. I saw it in Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. They have done an energy management system and they manage it very well. All hospital administrators, they have a possibility. They must go and see how they have done it. It's really a wonderful thing which they have done. Question of the sessions we keep at the end as they have been given in the culture. So thank you.
ਸੋ ਦਿਲਵੀ ਕਲੀ ਕਲੀ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਹਰੀਸ਼ ਕਲੀ ਔਰ ਟੋਪਿਕ ਕੌਨ 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 and and see the direct direct of tailor really and and on the tricky tricky cardiac surgery and maybe and maybe when when you shooting your shooting your channel he's the tailor you know new new technology to do that's the whole technology of the scenes that's the whole technology of the scenes that's what that's the whole technology of the scenes so so they were using sutures, sutures. the cost the of cost sutures was about 20 pence but then they started to go for the cost the of the cost 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 so he didn't so he anything he didn't tell them because the heat of the patient won't agree so he conducted a study that, that what is the what outcome, outcome difference between both types of patients after two after months, months he asked the presentation, presentation and presentation was that whether you use sutures or you don't use sutures the outcome, the outcome the made no difference he asked the patient to spend four months or 20 pounds everyone has to do the job perhaps this is the way of our presentation we learn and, uh, and uh, now we are going to dr prashantam assistant professor of the department of operations presentation aims to be conducted he is speaking about artificial, artificial intelligence in healthcare Hello doctor Hello sir hello sir hello sir are you on the line yes yes hi am i audible sir yeah hello am i am i audible yes sir yeah you are audible loud and clear thank you thank you yeah, hello everyone uh, respected teacher all my seniors competent uh, dr shakti gupta dr rk uh, sharma dr dk sharma dr sakthi dr hen chandra Dr. A.K. Gupta, Dr. Satyanandan, Dr. Mahapar, Organizing Committee, Dr. Javar Kulle, Dr. Eshpal Sharma, and uh, members of the Academy of Hospital Administration and moderators, uh, uh, moderator of the uh, scientific uh, committee today, R.K. Chakravedi, Dr. Anil, uh, Anil Kumar Gupta, and all others who are gathered here my friends and colleagues first of all i would like to congratulate uh, all india institute of medical science bhubaneswar for organizing such a wonderful national conference on hospital administration and thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak on the topic which has been dear to my heart artificial intelligence in healthcare So I divided my presentation in uh, uh, five, uh, uh, five sections. So I will be talking on motivation and use cases of AI, where I will be talking about uh, various dis- disruptive technologies in healthcare. And I will be talking about introduction and uh, technicalities of what is behind uh, artificial intelligence in making artificial intelligence. And I will be talking about the concepts of uh, smart hospitals, examples, how Uh, uh the principles and uh, uh, some of the examples uh, uh, how uh, technologies are adopted to make the hospital smarter gartner hype cycle as i have been mapping my journey to gartner hype cycle how how my journey started with the uh, 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 trend uh, uh, beyond data talking on So artificial intelligence has become a part and parcel of our life whether we have been working on our browser surfing checking emails social media phone or whether it is web shopping we all are experiencing some form of ai in the application looking at the recent advances such as amazon go a shopping experience in this video like where it Now, Amazon Go 
to the chain of hospitals, the convenience stores in the US, where customers can go to the shop, buy his her shopping items, and go out without trans transaction, and the bill gets automated and predicted. So you can see a lot of AI is applied in this, like for example, deep learning. sensor fusions, machine learning algorithms, IoT, so many, so many things are applied into, AI is applied into this. So another example I would like to bring here is kinetic for window retails. Now here you can see AI is applied for having seamless experience in retail shopping like here you can here the customer can try out the clothes as per their requirements and without any contact he can walk out so he can he can so he can have a seamless experience Here is another example where over a period of time, maybe in one or two years, maybe self driving cars. So many companies are already working, like Tesla, Baidu, Google. So already the cars have driven 8 million miles, millions of miles, and so you can, so people like, like, so people may experience driverless experience in the future. So where did it all start? It's nothing new. Basically, it started in 1950 where English mathematician Harold Turing published a paper entitled Computer, Computing Machinery, Machinery and Intelligence, which opened the doors to uh, what is called as AI. Now this was a year before the community adopted the term artificial intelligence as coined by John McCarthy. So Alan Turing proposed answering can machines think. Like basically Turing suggested that humans use available information as well as reasoning in order to solve problems to make decisions. So why cannot machines do the same thing? That opened a lot of Pandora boxes and lot of debates were conducted, lot of conferences were organized and so it, it has taken over a period of 50, 60, 70 years. So what we are experiencing now a full, a, a full, full blow, like a, um, a mature stage of artificial intelligence and this is all because of possible, like uh, this is all driven by uh, like uh, increased computation, increased storage, storage spaces. So these are the driving forces. So there is a biography on Alan Turing's, uh, this uh, the biography on Alan Turing, where he is a mathematician. So a uh, lot of uh, like adventurous life he has gone through, like um, uh, uh, the movie shows how he has decoded messages during the war using technology. So, coming to history of artificial intelligence and healthcare in uh, in uh, in healthcare, so it has it all began in 1970 with the Mycin, a road-based expert system, uh, advising the experts on appropriate antimicrobial therapy for uh, blood infections. In 1980, there was computer-assisted diagnostic tool uh, on coding clinical pathological reports. In 1990s, neural networks were applied to clinical medicine. So it took almost 40 years. And this is all possible because uh, large-scale adoption of EHR, they are publicly available data set, standardization of medical codes, rise in computation power and breakthrough in algorithms. So 
what is artificial intelligence in? so artificial intelligence is a science in simple words it's a science of engineering which making in, making uh, intelligent machines especially intelligent computer now basically you have large data set which creates uh, uh, to create uh, like uh, you create models you train them run them iteratively collect information extract information inferences correlations uh, for making decision processing uh, processes or other operations and that replicate human cognitive abilities so when you say large data set you have in the medical data set like images blood tests x ray images demographies med medical records genetic information genotypes phenotypes so you are applying this to ai model so once you apply this ai model so so the output is basically there are some insights like diagnosis predictions in terms of treatment in terms of prognosis so this is the whole thing which goes up goes ai so creating like what what does a data science what are, what does the team do basically so they are involved basically now you have an initial data set for example in the medical you have images you have um, you have medical records you have uh, sensor data so once you have this data a team of experts explores the data based on like uh, statistical inferences like basic statistics Uh, descriptive histogram visualization then they ident identify patterns so once they identify the missing values redundant data they clean those data they make it clean so you have a uh, data which is readable machine readable so once you have the pre process the expert he splits the data into 80 20 so once do then ai ai applicate ai models are applied like deep learning model uh, kn random forest and uh, based on, then you get an accuracy which is evaluated based on whether it is a classification or a regression you do some accuracy sensitivity specificity in the r square r so once you have this so once you so once the model predicted like for example if it is a, like uh, yeah, the model predicts whether it's a pneumonia or non pneumonia or for example uh, uh, detecting the diagnosing some uh, medical conditions for example uh, pneumo uh, uh, any 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 kind for example healthcare in the healthcare ia has been a part and parcel like, over a period of time for example Uh, there are so many news uh, now recently we have go uh, going through uh, epidemics and it has been like uh, 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 like uh, 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 like uh, uh, and this has got willingness to take more risky uh, 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 trying out new things and you can see there is another sofia genetics uh, who have been using Uh, patient genomic profile to diagnose illness and to better understand each patient unique health requirement by combining ai and dn dna and similarly recently there was a news like uh, google mind which uh, uh, we are able to spot acute kidney diseases 48 hours before the doc doctor spotted so similarly epidemic breakdown break uh, this epidemic similarly success in icus Uh, which have been so if you see this slide now life expectancy has been also increasing over period of time and you can see from 30 years it has gone over 80 years and this is all because of technological advancement but the practice of medicine in today's world even after so many discoveries have been inefficient crucial times and tremendous amount of resources are lost every day in the world of healthcare system misdiagnosis unnecessary addition of cost delayed treatment and dimin and and diminished survival and false positive rate this is all like basically with that with the advent of ai 
maybe we are we will be we will be forecasting our mortality may increase to 150 or 200 years in the coming year now another example i would like to bring here is application of image guide me image guided surgeries image guided robo robots are are used in operation theater with you surgeons accuracy about location of the site yeah yeah similarly ultrasound guided regional anesthesia can help practitioners quickly locate nerves so there are many examples so precision medicine so this is an example where eric topol mentioned in his book like the how 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 dna profiling and genomics have been used in uh, in in uh, identifying uh, or diagnosing diseases so medication pharmacy so this is one example where like robots have been used in pharmacy medications or so in intensive care you can see like they are using ai artificial intelligence in some of the you uh, know some of the hospitals like vitals to identify vital pain levels using body movements muscle twitching facial expression head movement collection collection of data so this is giving the doctors more kindly conclude accuracy on the yeah so this is one like surgeons where they are able to use artificial intelligence autonomously without using uh, surgeon assistance so this was tried on uh, uh, small intestine of the pig and it gave enormous credibility for the surgeons without like uh, without using autonomous without using surgery capabilities so so from the management side like it can improve administrative workflows patient workflows patient pathway guidelines from health record so health health records can be optimized so coming to the risk stratification so risk stratification can be stratified based on the population high high risk population low risk and medium risk now for example you have a diabetes diabetes population a high high risk population where you can segregate the patients based on high risk and you can um, you can uh, the um, uh, the population can be treated in a better way of in opti uh, a better way optimizing cost and resources so supplies so reduce uh, reduction in shortage shortage reduce waste so ais can assist in reducing so in human resources recruitment compensation management employee satisfaction management so ais have been dr purushottam you over shot by 5 minutes have been used in home care and rehabilitation so this is one nursing home where they have used uh, robots in nursing homes in managing patients the concept of smart hospitals so you smart hospitals is based on clinical excellence operation efficiency and patient centeredness the principle behind smart hospitals revolves around leadership patient education treatment accuracy digitalization medical care health care harmonization and decentralization the mckinsey has described that re, like re, most of the retail uh, like the most of the some of the services like vaccination specialist care laboratory will be moving out of the hospital whereas some some like some some 
will remain in the hospital like major surgery, trauma, intensive care unit, inpatient services. So these are some of the hospitals which has uh, uh, adopted technology in, in their hospitals. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So beyond, like, you have racial biases. So A, A is real. So why don't we all start learning? There are some schools which have already adopted AI into their technologies. Hospital administration, education plus artificial intelligence. So this is a movie on minority report. So deciding how maybe we will be another 10 years ahead of our uh, like in year. The crimes are predicted before happening so that murder can be stopped. The crime activities can be stopped before, before things happening. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you, thank Dr. Prashottam, for, for your lucid presentation, presentation. with the with profuse the involvement, involvement of videos and pictures and make it very easy to understand. I remember I once remember that uh, when I was uh, taking, taking meeting of my head of departments, I asked that when we were students, we were taught that you must see pulse of every patient. You must put a stethoscope wherever it is, whether it is needed or not. But you people, you don't see patient at all. You simply send him to technology. They say, sir, these days technology is becoming and computer is becoming more smarter and intelligent and doctors are becoming more idiotic. I'm sure that we'll have a proper balance of it. Uh, please inquire if Dr. Harish Pillai is joining or not. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. If Dr. Harish Pillai is not there, I, I throw the session, the session open for open questions. questions. I'll prefer the students to ask more questions first. Which I can see. So there are no questions and there is no confusion. So we come to the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would request the speakers to please come forward for the felicitation. And I would like the chairperson to please felicitate them. Thank you, sir. 
Now I would request Dr. Farooq Jhan to please come forward to felicitate our chairperson. Thank you so much, chairpersons and speakers, for pearls of wisdom. Now, moving ahead for scientific paper presentation, I would like to invite the chairpersons for this, Professor Dr. Hem Chandra sir, to the dais. <coughs> Professor Dr. Vipin Kaushal sir, to the dais, and Professor A K Gupta sir, to the dais. Dr. Salini Dash, Dr. Amit Chaudhary, Dr. Naveen Kumar, Dr. K.K. Pandita, Dr. Sujay Ranjan Dev, Dr. Somia Ji, Dr. Dichendra Sodhi, Dr. Ajmal. I would request the speakers to please keep it brief. You have been allotted only 8 minutes and you will have to complete the entire presentation within that time. Please quickly come backstage so we can proceed with the paper presentations. A very good afternoon, respected chairs, my teachers, and the friends and colleagues here. I am Dr. Kamal Gulati from the AIMS Delhi, and the topic which I am going to discuss today is strengthening medical leadership capacity and unaddressed issue in Indian healthcare system. As we know, a central challenge for leaders in healthcare and beyond is how to align these three crucial elements of the organization, that is vision, operations and culture, and there is growing evidence now in the literature that clinicians' involvement in hospital management can lead to a positive impact on quality of care and management of resources. And this puts the medical leadership in the picture. But what is medical leadership? Medical leadership is a physician's ability to serve both as a manager and a leader of diverse teams in pursuit of maximally effective patient care. And there's growing evidence as published in, uh, in the PubMed in the last two decades that a lot of work is being done in the field of medical leadership, especially in the Western context. But a leadership crisis prevails in Indian profession, in the Indian healthcare system. And possible reasons could be that regulatory bodies did not focus much on leadership development in our healthcare system, and serious efforts were not made to develop leadership capacity in our healthcare system. And if we believe that if doctors need to bring reform, they need to be involved in the system at an early age. Our national health policy gives us the national mandate to invest into leadership capacity building in our healthcare system. The policy recommends development of leadership skills and strengthening human resource governance. And with this introduction, we did the first study from India, a study to assess leadership competences and to assess the leadership development needs of doctors in India. And for this, we used the NHS Medical Leadership Competency Framework and identified 30 leadership competences. 
540 doctors participated in our study and we collected data from four metropolitan cities in India. We asked our participants to self-assess their proficiency levels for each of the competencies on a Likert scale 1 to 5, 1 being very poor and 5 being very good, and rate their perceived level of importance of each competency on a Likert scale, ranging 1 not important to 5 very important. It was published in BMJ Leader and on the left side in the box you can see the list of competencies and the five domains of the NHS Leadership Competency Framework. That is demonstrating personal qualities, working with others, managing services, improving services and setting direction. When we did the uh, uh, data analysis, we found that overall, all 540 doctors, we noted the significant leadership competency gaps exist in our healthcare system, both in public as well as private sector hospitals. Interestingly, there were three variables which had a significant influence on the leadership competencies. And the first was the leadership and management training. We found that the physicians who had some formal management training found to be more competent than their counterparts. When we made a comparison of the speciality, we found that the doctors who were working full-time in hospital administration speciality rated themselves more competent than their counterparts in clinical and paraclinical specialities. And the leadership experience, doctors who had management experience of more than three and a half years of experience, they reported better leadership skills than their counterparts. And interestingly, 95% of the doctors who participated in our study they perceived a need for a leadership development program and accordingly we conducted an off-site residential LDP which was attended by 96 physicians from both public and private sector hospitals and we did a pre and post assessment using the same survey questionnaire and again we found statistically significant differentiation. Now this poses a big question that why medical leadership has not advanced in India, we tried to find some uh, responses and the possible reasons could be that creating dedicated time for leadership training and education in the light of medical curriculum poses a big challenge. Doctors, especially clinicians are possibly concerned that devoting time in management roles will distract them from patient care and limit opportunities to pursue research. Further hierarchical structure of medicine, linking of promotion to greater specialization, and years served may also discourage some clinicians from getting involved in leadership roles. And importantly, medical leadership is not yet recognized as a distinct speciality in our country. So as we know that in the absence of the leadership training, doctors in India experience leadership challenges. In contrast to Western context, India might first deliver LDPs for its senior doctors, but these leadership development programs need to be contextualized for Indian context, and state agencies, medical schools, and professional bodies need to be engaged and given adequate autonomy and funding to conduct leadership development programs. In the wake of COVID-19, leadership of innovation is now much greater, and we believe that the barriers to distribution of leadership may dissipate as the innovation imperative becomes more obvious. India is currently undergoing two major reforms, ABPMJ and the Pradhan Mantri Swasthya Seva Suraksha Yojana. And we believe that investing into leadership capacity building can help us deliver these two reforms efficiently and effectively. So to conclude, the national health policy gives us the national mandate to invest into leadership capacity building. So efforts should be made to strengthen leadership capacity building to advance the ongoing national health reforms, that is ABPMJ and the PMSSY scheme. And most importantly, collaborative research, both at national and international level, is required to generate more evidence for leadership development and design medical leadership competency frameworks like the NHS UK and the Canadian models specific to our Indian healthcare system. And I rest my presentation here with a quote that while there are many leaders within medicine, there is little leadership of medicine as a whole. Thank you very much. Speaking the blessings of all my gurus, uh, this is Dr. Shalini, PhD scholar from the Department of Health System Management Studies, JSS Academy of Higher Education, Mysore. Hope I'm audible. Yeah. So I'm presenting the topic on uh, process re-engineering of radiology services uh, for optimization of TAT, that is turnaround time. As we all know, radiology department is one of the integral part of the hospital. It consists of many units uh, like X-ray, USG department, uh, and uh, CT scan, MRI, etc. So this study is done especially on the USG services to optimize the TAT. Uh, initially, there was uh, a uh, delay in the USG uh, services, so this study is undertaken uh, as they identified by the hospital. 
study is done in the 225 bedded multi-speciality hospital uh, for a period of two months. Both retrospective and prospective data is taken uh, around 1,685, where 785 is the prospective data. Uh, the people who included in the study means uh, were the radiology department HOD and the consultant radiologist, junior consultants and medical transcriptionist and the staff nurses. And the data tool used is a TAT format which in includes arrival and check-in time, check-out time and the report finalization time. As you see, the average turnaround time is calculated from the report finalized time to the patient check-in time. So as you see here, this is diagram uh, where it's showing. Yeah. So this is the depicting the uh, radiology department of the 225 uh, uh, hospital. So where the red dot is done, after the, before the study was uh, undertaken, they were uh, concerns about the USG services because uh, the cases what we receive in US department is uh, comparatively more compared to other units of the radiology department. So there was a delay in the TAT which is uh, been uh, seen in the retrospective data. After the study is implemented, observing prospectively, uh, making the process flow chart, we identified that there is an unnecessary movement uh, from the staff nurse who is there in the ultrasound uh, department. She used to hand over the written, uh, handwritten report to the medical transcriptions where, uh, hope I'm able to, uh, sorry, uh, as you can see the red, there is, a, yeah. So, uh, this is a place uh, where the medical transcription used to sit and uh, I'm not able to make it out the uh, arrows. Okay, fine. Okay, uh, the staff nurse used to come hand it over the report to the medical transcriptionist in the separate uh, room where all the reports used to be uh, typed and dispatched. And even whenever they need a doubt, a medical transcription is to go back to the ultrasound department and go check what is the uh, correction need to be done and then they used to report finalize, get the signature, they used to uh, dispatch it. So uh, retrospectively, there was 95 minutes was taken as a TAT. After implementing, we identified these flaws and made sure that a dedicated medical transcription sits in the ultrasound department itself, takes the dictation from the radiologist, types in immediately and on the system the doctor, the radiologist sees what the correction need to be done and immediately the signature is the finalization of the report is done, signature is given and then immediately counter three where you can see the report has been handed over. This minimum correction made a significant change from 95 minutes of TAT turnaround time reduced to 47 minutes, almost 50 minutes of uh, time is being saved. So uh, this is the, as I mentioned, as a structural re-engineering, placing this and the process re-engineering, just making a simple change in the process flow made a significant difference. This is a fishbone diagram where it is depicting uh, different various causes. So increasing the USG tattoo, which can be a poor signage system, poor communication or unfamiliar protocols in the patient thing. So these are things which is caused delay in the ultrasound uh, uh, attack. And uh, there are some value added and non-value added activities we have seen. For example, in building and registration, we see that uh, there is a centralized uh, registration counter which is adding non-value. So making us decentralized means having a separate billing counter in the radiology department itself uh, made a little uh, difference. That's what we suggested and this is showing the uh, graph both uh, prospective and retrospective study. And uh, the study is at par with both international and national level uh, study conduct in the similar... Uh, Time study. is up. Yep, thank you. Thank you. No, I call upon Amit Chaudhary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Janice. Uh, myself, Dr. Ahmed and uh, I'm here for the paper presentation. 
my PPT is just getting ready. So I would like to tell you about my uh, presentation. Uh, the, <coughs> it is a study on the comparative cost analysis for sterilization of gauze pieces and dressing pads using cloth bags and steel bins in steam sterilizer. So whenever we see that, there is beware of little expenses. A small lake will sink a great ship. Like yesterday also we have seen some of the sessions on this. So in hospital, we have a lot of places where that um, a lot of extra expenditures are there. If we can control, if we can save a single penny, it will cost in profitability and like saving and it will help the hospital to sustain for a longer and give a better uh, patient care to the uh, patient in affordable prices. So my study is about the gauze pieces. So why, why we need this study actually? The existing process flow in our hospital was that all the uh, all the departments, all the, especially the wards and ICUs, they used to send their um, um, this housekeeping person with the still bins to the department of CSSD to get the things sterilized there. So what happens that they used to come with the indent paper and then again in the afternoon they used to come back and collect all those uh, all those bins back to the wards ward area. So it used to lead to a lot of time wasting plus the still bins used to be filled according to the requirement of that particular department. Like if department requiring only 5 pads, so only that in the full bin only 5 pads will be uh, kept there. So a lot of space will be the empty in that case. So we thought that can we do it like in the way that we can make a, a lot like uh, the full bag we can fill up and we can do the sterilization at the same time. So the, our aim of that study to reduce the cost in sterilization of gauze pieces and dressing pads. So to, uh, for, uh, to fulfill that aim, the, our objective was that first of all to ca calculate the cost that in each cycle of sterilization, like how much one cycle of steam sterilization will cost. Second that what is the maximum number we can do uh, sterilize while using the steel bins and how much is that um, uh, minimum uh, maximum number of uh, 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 gauze pieces and gauze pad we can sterilize by using the cloth bags. To, uh, then after that to compare the cost benefits of it and give a an suggestion and recommendation for the same. The methodology was the descriptive and prospective study. The study period was 6 months, May 2020 to October 2020. Uh, study design, what we have done that, that we have taken that, per, first of all we have calculated all that, uh, how much one cycle will cost by machine hour rate. Then we have done that cost analysis for sterilization of gauze pieces and dressing pads are done. After that, uh, we had that uh, per day load, like how much gauze pieces is required actually per day. And then after that cost difference we have calculated, then whatever we have sterilized every day for like consecutive 10 days, we have sent that one of the piece to the microbiology department to check that is it valid or not, is it useful to not any culture is happening or not, like is it completely sterile or not. So that, uh, that we have done for infection control protocols. <coughs> Can you open this? this uh, cost we have uh, calculated that machine hour rate in machine hour rate we have taken that how much is the total maintenance cost what is that regular maintenance cost like gasket sometime is required that uh, uh, oiling will be requiring for the CSSD machine like every two years or per cycle so we have divided into it then after that what is the maintenance has been taken for last six years we have divided into it then we have <coughs> sir very first sheet very first sheet please very first sheet so we had that uh, more, more, more. Can you please go? First sheet, first sheet, please. First sheet, sir. Keep going there. that uh, every machine hour cost by doing that how much bovidic strip will cost biological indicator every day what we are using how much that will cost so like that we have calculated for that uh, full like one cycle how much it will cost then what we have done we have filled that uh, cloth bags with the how much number of uh, uh, how much number we can fill it with go back to presentation so we can uh, then after that we have checked that how many gauze pieces and gauze pad can be filled in that uh, cloth bag and how much will be filled in that our uh, uh, steel bins then we have calculated the cost according to that. Keep going next. Next please. Yeah. So we have checked that in gauze in bins, like we had three kind of bins over there, small bin, medium bin and large bin. We have saw that that only eight gauze padders and 50 or, or 50 uh, gauze pieces can be filled in the small bins. 15 and 60 will be the numbers in the medium bin and large bin was 40 or if we fill it with the gauze pieces, it will be 200. So we made it all the permutation and combination and we finally reached out that maximum number of bins we can put it inside was two large bins plus eight medium bins plus one small bin, which act, if we 
only fill with the gauze pieces, it will be 930 gauze pieces. And if you try to fill it with the gauze pad packets, then it will be 208. This 930 is the number of packets and uh, 208 is the number of packets for gauze pads. Every gauze uh, packet contains, one packet consists five gauze pieces and every pad uh, packet consists two gauze pads. Then similarly, we have done with the bags, that how much we can fill into the bag. So when we f fill in the bag, we found that on 420 number of packets we can fill and 1820 we can fill it in the gauze pieces. So the cost we have compared after that, so total cost came for this was like 3268 rupees, uh, then 1735 for that uh, bins and when we compare those cost with each other, then it came that uh, that uh, sterilization cost in bins was that 400, 998 and 446. So what we have found that, that there was a significant saving in that. So per day we have saved around 1217 rupees. Then per month if we calculate it is 36,510 and per year costing when we are checked, it was 4,44,205 rupees. Then we have done this microbiology test. So this is that uh, um, report from the microbiologist. 10 days we have continuously sent that and we have got this report. So we recommended that uh, cloth bags can be used over the bins. The bins no, what... complete. We have been given more time because of disturbance. Complete in next 15 minutes, seconds, 15 seconds. Okay, sir. Uh, so that uh, bins are to be uh, cleaned regularly in the ward area and further study to be checked to uh, use of the 350 liters of water what is getting only used for the uh, vacuum pump to clean. So after this study was done in 2020, so what was all the impact we have in our hospital? First of all, we have saved a tremendous amount of savings will be there. Then porters used to come two times in our departments for CSSD, so that manpower we have reduced. Plus we went to paper to paperless as they were coming with the indent paper, but here they have only raising through the HIS system and they're finishing it and 700 liters of soft water thank you 30 liters thank of you, please this we have saved okay thank you okay thank you. these are my references good evening uh, our study is on uh, Aishman Bharat uh, there was so much uh, discussion around uh, when Aishman Bharat got link uh, introduced in India uh, that uh, whether private hospitals will be able to uh, meet the uh, bundle packages that is being offered by Aishman Bharat so uh, we embarked on a study uh, to compare the top 10 procedures, top 10 procedures that were uh, done at our hospital uh, in, in terms of volumes. We compared it with uh, uh, the uh, secondary data we had picked up, uh, which was published by IMA Tamil Nadu uh, about, with their procedures. So yeah, so uh, I titled it as uh, the cost dilemma to private hospitals, Ayushman Bharat scheme in India, the cost dilemma to private hospitals. Uh, in 1990s, uh, due to economic liberalization, there was, uh, uh, there was a pathogenic development of diseases uh, that happened in, uh, in health indicators in India. We saw there was uh, uh, lifestyle diseases affecting the rich, whereas poor people still had, uh, were around malnourishment conundrum, I mean, uh, the bottom line indicators were not improving. So that's when uh, Indian government had to uh, talk about uh, health insurance schemes to the uh, downtrodden people. Uh, so 2005 onwards, we had a, a major RSBY scheme, then it was revamped uh, later by 2015-16. The present government introduced the PMJ scheme. And uh, for there are so many public institutions that are being developed now. Uh, like All India Institute of Medical Sciences across India, but still private hospitals become the major uh, service providers. Uh, and uh, most of these private hospitals uh, uh, are uh, ending up uh, in a lot of fixed costs, which is like around 40% of uh, material budget will go off in, uh, in operating budget every year. And at the same time, in the initial construction cost, at least 30% will go off into the equipment and furniture costs and all. So these being the high fixed costs, we thought we will compare uh, our hospital packages that we offer in a medical college teaching hospital. So the study design was a qualitative observational study done over uh, retrospective data we collected for the past six months uh, about the top number of procedures that were done and we had taken their hospitalization cost and uh, the operation costs and we compared it with the secondary data. 
on an average we uh, uh, operate around 600 to 700 patients that is about 20 to 30 admissions and discharges through Aishman Bharat scheme in our hospital in medical specialties general medicine as you all know general medicine cardiology and cancer care are the top uh, uh, departments whereas in surgical specialties uh, we had general surgery and ENT and OBG uh, departments having the major number of cases and per day we charge around 900 rupees for a out of pocket payment patients so when when I pulled out the data these were the top nine procedures, uh, septoplasty uh, with uh, fundoscopic uh, septoplasty, uh, uh, which, which was like the first column talks about Ayushman Bharat bundle package and the second column is our hospital bill for an out-of-pocket patient in a general category patient. Uh, we, uh, laparoscopic procedures, we found a huge difference. We were getting half the amount than what, I mean, more than uh, like 150% lesser than what we were expecting. And uh, uh, when I compared it with uh, the studies published by uh, uh, Indian Medical Association and FIKI studies, this was actually a 2017 study uh, where FIKI says, suggested that in private hospitals they were incurring for same 500% uh, difference they had found in uh, septoplasty for laparoscopic procedures 700% uh, difference of price they were like uh, Ayushman was 12,000 package but they were charging 86,800 in so I do not know uh, from which are the private hospitals they have collected this is the secondary data that we had uh, compared with so obviously we can notice that private hospitals will bloat up the bills and you know that's how this comes so my uh, findings were like private medical college we were uh, uh, getting half the pay uh, whereas uh, uh, private hospitals were getting quarter uh, quarter the amount that they were expecting uh, against the uh, private patients so uh, what we can see is a lot of private hospitals will have non-acceptance of uh, empanelment towards Ayushman Bharat and especially laparoscopic procedures uh, in both our setup also and private hospitals also the money being uh, uh, paid by a private patient was far high and in our hospital generally general surgeons of junior cadre and all get trained in laparoscopic procedures so our footfalls might get affected and the training also might get affected uh, so what we suggested our clinicians was because length of stay was uh, pre-planned for every procedure about five days we thought if patients can get investigations done in a government hospital and come on the first day itself and get operated in our hospital within five days we can discharge the patient and the second thing that uh, so that the pre anesthesia clearances and all will not delay the operating days and the length of stay won't increase so if we can manage like that probably we can achieve break even in uh, against these packages so with this uh, uh, we conclude that Private players also would uh, love to have uh, more uh, Aishman Bharat package scheme patients to survive in the business. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I invite Dr. K.K. Pandita for his presentation. And good afternoon, uh, respected chairperson, and good afternoon, audience. Um, uh, I am going to share with you our experiences during COVID, what preparedness we had in our hospital. So I, along with Professor Noor Topno and one engineer, Samvit Sahu, conduct an observational study in our hospital, Nigrim Shilong. So you know the new variant of uh, viral infection started in December 2019 which was later found to be a variant of um, SARS um, coronavirus and named as, uh, the disease was later named as COVID. On um, 11th of March, it's not moving, I have to move it, hey? I was just, yes. So on 11th uh, March, cor corona disease status was announced as epidemic. Uh, from pandemic uh, epidemic to pandemic on 13th april first positive case was detected in state of meghalaya who was a 75 year old uh, physician later 12 of his family members were also found uh, covid positive in fact his son-in-law had come from um, wuhan he was a um, pilot and uh, he was asymptomatic and uh, his this gentleman got the infection so it uh, ours was a prospective study for six months 
um, it uh, was observational data was collected from all the notifications uh, and guidelines from uh, various uh, our hospital and from WHO and Ministry of Health and uh, CDC a layout plan of the hospital was also studied for uh, any modifications so our observations were that uh, three levels of the covid uh, management was created level first it was in emergency area 16 beds were designated covid uh, 19 um, beds and uh, then COVID, uh, level b was more important because our hospital structure has a uh, the hospital this um, it has a perfect structure of isolating 130 beds for uh, isolating these covid uh, patients and uh, level uh, c was uh, icu uh, it was 18 bedded as he was created with ventilators this is uh, the negrims if anybody has visited this is a perfect structure and in the last if here you can see this part of the hospital can be isolated from rest of the hospital this is casualty area and this is a separate entrance from backside uh, which was very uh, ideal for creating uh, level b so clinical management, the responsibility of managing level A and B was entrusted to Department of uh, Medicine and level C, that is ICU, was uh, managed by uh, the Department of Anesthesiology. Some uh, minor changes, equipments were shifted from other areas to the COVID, uh, this level B area, so that uh, patients don't have to move for x-rays and other USG and other investigations. One ambulance was also dedicated for shifting COVID patients from level A to level um, B or C. So a roster was also framed, five groups of nursing staff, uh, senior residents, PGs, five groups were ma made in different categories so that four groups are on duty and uh, one group was kept as a reserve if in case uh, the, there is they contract this infection, they can be put on duties. So, my communications, if there was timely uh, dissemination of communication regarding uh, meetings, core committee had a meeting every day in the morning in the office of the medical superintendent where director was also present uh, all the days and the decisions made in the uh, core group committee meetings were disseminated to all the areas of the hospital. On 8th February, a contingency plan to tackle the pandemic was circulated. On 12th of Feb, minutes of the review meeting held by the director regarding the progress of the different uh, structural modifications in the hospital were also um, uh, taken by the director and circulated to all the uh, stakeholders. On 21st, SOP for infection control and prevention were circulated. Trainings in infection, on 6th February, first training session was conducted by the Department of Microbiology. It was regarding correct techniques of donning and doffing of PPEs and uh, hand hygiene, uh, cathetics, um, uh, sample uh, swab collection, handling, transportation of the samples. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sir. Your time is up. We need to conclude. Uh, good evening, respected chairpersons, uh, esteemed speakers, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the topic of my presentation is a rapid transformation of an existing testing facility area for COVID-19 into a fully functional pediatric emergency in 72 hours time. This is an experience from a tertiary care teaching hospital, which is also a published piece from Indian Journal of Pediatrics now. The time allotted to me is five minutes and I'll adhere to that. So very succinctly taking you through the flow of presentation while touching upon a brief background, the key challenges involved, what was the rate limiting step what was the internal lead time, the finer aspects of planning, the final outcome and references. We all know that during second surge of COVID-19, there was a precipitating need for capacity 
a capacity enhancement, it was greatly felt in our pediatric emergency, both in terms of number of beds and circulation space. It was decided in one of our morning meetings under the chairmanship of the director Ames to relocate our existing testing area to another place in the campus and transform this testing area into a new pediatric emergency. But the mandate which was given to us was the 72 hours time. So the key challenges which were involved, the rapid transformation of this area into pediatric emergency, pediatric emergency under the full-blown lockdown. That was the first challenge. The integration of various elements, civil structures, electrical fitments, extension of manifold five pipelines in this area, setting up of an independent registration area, the procurement of equipment and essential furniture items on an emergent basis. How we planned for it? Be that as it may that it had to be done in 72 hours time, we spearheaded the project with precise ground level planning, listing and cohorting of activities, clear ear marking of roles amongst the team members, transcribed the activities onto a Gantt chart, assigned timelines to them and identified the rate limiting step. We identified the internal lead time right at the beginning of planning and we gainfully utilized it. The time in which the testing area was to be handed over to us, we considered it as the internal lead time and we utilized it in ground level planning, extension of manifold pipelines from the adjacent trauma emergency department, organization of various teams of civil, electrical and manifold workers. The biggest bottleneck uh, in this whole process was the extension of manifold type pipeline works from the adjacent trauma ED area to pediatric emergency. This it required an in independent piece of planning. It required a brief shutdown of around 30 minutes of manifold of the trauma ED. At any point in time, we had six to eight patients on life support equipment in the red area of trauma ED who had to be mobilized to other patient care areas. With end-to-end -end coordination with our manifold team and the staff of trauma ED, we got the extension of manifold pipelines done with creation of new isolation walls from the trauma ED which was under the window of the internal lead time. This being the identified as the rate limiting step in our timeline, the execution of it kept us ahead of the planning curve. Various other civil and electrical works which were entailed included dismantling of existing structures, putting up of wash basins and RO systems, placement of signages, setting up of registration area, placement of curtain assembly for each bed, creation of electric panels at head ends of the beds, provision of UPS points and alternate source of electricity for life-saving equipment which were undertaken on a war footing, mapping of IT points and so on and so forth. I'll just flex your attention on the finer aspects of planning in this whole exercise which is the takeaway lesson, the cohorting of activities and clear delineation of roles, effective utilization of internal lead time, identification of rate limiting step right at the beginning and its independent planning. Multiple teams working together, decommissioning of equipment and its installation to a new place in the most systematic manner. The final outcome, in this adversity of COVID-19 through this exercise, we got to have a floor area and beds which was about 279 square meters and 16 beds, almost 3.6 times the floor area and double the bed strength of old pediatric emergency. I would like to mention here that while it required significant planning on paper and on-site visits by the members of team from hospital administration, pediatrics, engineers and manifold, creation of this spacious contemporary pediatric emergency was possible within 72 hours time. These are the Thank few you, references. I'll end up here that the price of anything is in life is the amount of effort you exchange for it. Thank you. Thank you. I request now Dr. Ajmal to present his paper. Very good evening to one and all present here. I am Muhammad Ajmal KP, pursuing MBA Hospital Administration from JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, Mysuru. And very thankful for the great opportunity and my topic is cost analysis of expenditure incurred per bed per day in tertiary care, tertiary care teaching hospital of super speciality ICU in CTBS. Mm. 
The intensive care unit is an independent department of a hospital with special staff and equipment with specialized equipment dedicated to monitoring care and treatment of patients with diseases, injuries, or potentially fatal complications, provides expertise and special facilities to support patient vital functions. And the percentage of the critical beds at present in large teaching hospital is around 5 to 8 percentage. But there is a strong need to increase the number of ICU beds at least to 10 percentage of the hospital beds. And this knowledge of economics is essential to increase economic efficiency as well as to evaluate the cost of effectiveness of care. And the objective of this study is to identify the different cost centers included in care of CTVS ICU and to determine the all direct and indirect costs associated with the above costs and to determine the cost per bed in CTVS ICU at a super speciality hospital. And we use a retrospective study methodology we use a retrospective study methodology. A retrospective study was conducted at CTVS ICU 11 bedded in a tertiary care teaching hospital and one year data has been collected for the study period. And data record for the study was collected from the various sources such as engineering department. Engineering department helped to collect the electricity bill for the above mentioned period, land cost, construction and maintenance cost, cost of air conditioning, water consumption and area of ICU. I'm from the biomedical department to get the list of equipment in ICU and also manifold. And CSSD to, get the, to gather the information relating to supply sterile sets during the above mentioned period to the ICU cost. And general store stationery from respective ICUs referred to collect the data regarding the linen supplies from laundry and department during the above mentioned time period. And supplies include drugs, consumables, disposables, cleanings, items, disinfectants, etc. And this data collected for one year was used to compute per month and per day expenses. And talk about the results. The cost centers in CTV ICUs are salaries, drugs and disposables, investigations, general stores, laundry services, CSSD, infrastructural costs, electricity charge, water charge, equipment costs. And this cost we clarify uh, to direct and indirect costs. And direct costs are human resource, drugs and disposables, and radiology and laboratory. And indirect costs are general stores, laundry services, CSD, infrastructural costs, electricity charges, water charges, and equipment. And these are the tabular presentation of costs incurred in CTVS ICU. And we got the total of per day cost of 50,552.36. And this is the pictographical representation of costs incurred in CTVS ICU. We see the mayor. For nearly 47 percentage of uh, cost comes in human resource, and the least amount will come to the radio, radiology and laboratory. And the cost of CTVS ICU per bed per day for 11 bed, we got 50,552.36, and the total per bed per day cost is 4,595.67. And the summary and conclusion, as the number of the patient and competing demand on the finance, increases, uh, the task of costing becomes even more challenging. The study was concluded that the total cost per bed per day is in 4,595 rupees. And the major cost centers in CTVS ICUs are human resource, drugs and disposables. And the role of clinical and non-clinical staffs cannot be considered in lighter way as they perform patient care activities after physician's orders. And it is a matter of fact that the running cost estimates can be across approximate or near to approximate figures as it involves several direct and indirect components to be considered. The currently study is one such attempt to understand the economic functioning of CTVS ICU which help the administrator to have a bird eye on view of the operation for further decision making. And also this, uh, this study helped the hospital administrator to understand if they are uh, planning to increase or decreasing the hospital ICU beds. This study is very helpful for them. Thank you, uh, Dr. Almar.